Hi everyone. I'm Helena Carbon. I'm the president of Just World Educational and I want to welcome you to our third session of our webinar series, The World After COVID. The world has been changing extremely rapidly for the past few months. So that's why we're doing the, uh, the project here and talking in particular about America's role in the world. So today I am extremely happy to welcome Bill Fletcher, Jr. Bill, it's really good to have you with us. It's great to be here, Helen. Thank you so much. And Bill, I guess you're with us from extra galactic territory and you can maybe tell us a little bit more about the view from outer space later but uh, i love your background thank you thank you so the um the two earlier sessions that we've done in this series were um webinars with richard falk and medea benjamin and in case you didn't actually manage to catch those earlier webinars they are now available um we as archived videos and you can find the links for them at bit.ly slash big W, big A, big C dash info. And um, Charlotte, by the way, we have a, a wonderful person working with us behind the scenes here, Charlotte Cates, who will be um, hosting the Q&A session after the discussion that Bill and I will be having. Um, Charlotte is going to be posting all kinds of useful things in the chat. So if you go to, if you open your chat, then you will find all the uh, links and um, resources and information. If you have any questions throughout the uh, the webinar, you tech questions, you can you can send them to Charlotte in the chat there. And then later, when we have the discussion with the Q and A, you can submit your questions either through the chat or through the Q&A button, all of which you should find at the foot of your um, Zoom screen. So anyway, Bill Fletcher, who is a veteran activist for labor rights, decolonization and racial justice. He's the former president of the Trans Africa Forum, a senior scholar with the Institute for Policy Studies, He's a widely syndicated columnist and a regular media commentator. He's co-authored books on um, black workers in the labor movement. And he's the sole author of a book called They're Bankrupting Us and 20 Other Myths About Unions. So a long time labor activist. His current website magazine is globalafricanworker.com. So um, I just want to put in a little um, personal thing that I found very moving um, about Bill's uh, background and his writings. 10 years ago, Bill Fletcher um, wrote a blog post about a text by W.E.B. Du Bois called The Souls of White Folk. And it's not very well known. Um, it's not as well known as his earlier collection of essays, The Souls of Black Folk, but I think especially for me as a, as a person who enjoys white privilege in this, you know, white privileged world that we have, it was stunning because W.E.B. Du Bois was writing this um, exactly 100 years ago in 1920. And I have, I'm gonna share my screen um, and, People who know me know that this always takes a long time to get organized. Um, okay. Oh, and we, I guess we need to do this in slide view, slideshow. So hopefully you are now seeing the links that I have put up to Bill Fletcher's 2010 take on the W.E.B. Du Bois, um, Souls of White Folk. And then I found the text of Souls of White Folk itself. And I, both of these, I urge people to go and read if they want to understand um, kind of what's been happening since the end of World War I regarding white privilege being embedded in the international system. So sorry, that's all a little bit of a long um, introduction, but Bill, it's great to have you with us. Um, we're going to be Thank discussing um, the 
Black Lives Matter here movement here in uh, the United States and its global resonance. We're going to be talking about the effects on the United States global hegemony. We're going to be talking about what kind of lessons people um, trying to organize in this era of the erosion of American hegemony. What lessons we can take from the anti-apartheid movement um, back in the 1980s and 1990s. And then um, at the end, we'll talk about um, the Democratic Party and politics in this country and um, the way that many people in the Democratic Party seem to be uh, stoking and uh, second Cold War with China and, and what that means for all of us who are organizing in this country. So Bill, first of all, um, tell us your assessment of the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement. You've been a, a Black American activist for just about all of your life. What does mm -hmm. this emergence, eruption right now of the Black Lives Matter movement mean to you? Well, Helena, there's several things. I think it's important to offer the context. And the context includes that the efforts around the broad movement for Black Lives began several years ago, in, uh, particularly in the aftermath of the, uh, the Ferguson uh, uprising and, and the killings by the police um, and Michael Brown. The, um, and, and so you had this eruption and this uh, rise to the surface of the slogan, Black Lives Matter, which then became the name of an organization and then became the associated with a broad movement of not just an organization, but several, uh, mainly younger uh, African-Americans who were putting the issue of police atrocities on the table. Um, they were also trying to connect the issue of police atrocities and, uh, and repression to broad issues facing Black America. And then there was a subsiding of this effort. And particularly after uh, Trump was elected, the movement seemed in many ways to be off the screen. Uh, now, People continued to organize, but there was, a, there was a, a decline in activity. I think what we've seen in the last several weeks is the result of several things coming together and creating a critical mass situation. The COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, the economic collapse, which was sparked by COVID-19, but not caused by COVID-19. Um, the uh, several lynchings that took place almost like on a weekly basis of African Americans, um, Trump's uh, fueling the fire on all of this, a larger environmental crisis, and then certain things that many people are, pro are probably not paying attention to, but that there were circumstances that there were factors that did not directly involve African-Americans that contributed to this, such as the reality that the disproportionate number of police killings in this country had been carried out against Native Americans. So there was the fusion of these different factors together that I would argue led to this explosion. And it's been remarkable on many levels, including how multiracial it is, um, how international it is, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, and, um, but it's very diffuse and it's, it's spontaneous, Helena, and, and that's really important for the listeners to get in that this is not a movement or rebellions led by one organization or even two. And, and therefore, even slogans like um, defund the police or abolish the police that have been raised in the movement carry with them various interpretations, um, depending on the different social forces that have been involved. The question we face now is what comes next? 
Yeah, I guess that is a huge question and we'll, uh, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, just before we move on, I want to uh, play a little slideshow that I pulled together, um, just images of the resonance of Black Lives Matter um, around the world, because I think this is an important aspect of the sort of the global dynamic right now. Um, so here we go with, um, okay, share. And now I have to, okay, um, view slideshow, okay. <laughs> So here it is, um, Black Lives Matter resonating worldwide. This I found, it, it's from the north of England. It's obviously an Afro-Brit person with very important slogans that she's holding up. You know, I grew up in, uh, in England and I was always struck after I came to this country, how much more advanced Americans, white Americans were in recognizing the ills of slavery than white Brits had been when I was growing up. Um, whereas of course the, the slave trade was completely um, started by Europeans, I mean, <laughs> and, and run by Europeans, um, including British, um, Dutch, Portuguese, Spanish, and Europeans you know, instituted and ran the institution for a very long time. Um, and so here we have this Afro-Brit and, and actually her t-shirt is great. It says more blacks, more dogs and more Irish um, as a take on, you know, the signs that they used to have up saying no blacks, no dogs and no Irish. Um, and then this is in Bristol. Some of you may have seen what happened. This is a guy called Edward Colston who was a, a famous and much admired slave trader in Bristol, UK. So last week he was toppled off his pedestal and then a, the um, demonstrators rolled him along the street. And I'm kind of interested in the racial makeup of the people rolling, rolling him along the street there. And there he goes into the river. So he, I mean, he got, got treated for all those hundreds of years, a whole lot better than, than the enslaved African people um, whom his companies um, took across the Atlantic. So now I've gone across the, uh, the English Channel to, to France and we have um, Afro-French um, and the, the guy on the left is saying, I can't breathe in French. Um, so this, the, the slogans definitely have a lot of resonance and this obviously also in Paris and this is a, a wonderful um, demonstration organized by I, I think a Moroccan, um, a, a, a French woman of Moroccan origin, but um, a massive demonstration there and here's another um, Afro French woman. Um, who has been organizing in memory of her brother Adama Touraré, who uh, was killed by the police there in, in France. So this is a, a worldwide phenomenon. This is from uh, Brussels. And finally, this is from Rio de Janeiro. Um, Vidas negras importam. I mean, the slogans are worldwide. So, um, Bill, take it away. What, what, what do you think is the meaning of all this? <laughs> well, I, um, at first I thought, well, this is good. You know, people expressing solidarity. Um, and it reminded me of things that happened during the Vietnam War. When people around the world were uh, opposing U.S. aggression. But what's different about this is that it's, in some ways, Helen, I, I've, I've started thinking of it as the outlines of a new international because it's not simply supporting us in the United States, but it's saying that we in our struggles are facing a very similar, if not the same opponent. So whether it's in occupied Palestinian territories, whether it's in Paris or London, or any number of other places, people are raising up the issues of uh, racist oppression and profound social inequalities. And they're, they're making the George Floyd atrocity 
a teachable moment, utilizing their own experiences. And this is, this really is quite remarkable. Uh, and, and I think that it, for us in the United States, we're not used to that kind of solidarity. Um, and even in some of the more advanced movements. And so I think that looking at what the world is doing means to me that certainly those of us in the Black Freedom Movement need to understand that our circumstances are not unique. And Helena, this is a very controversial position because there are forces within the Black Freedom Movement that vehemently object to uh, what, what, what can only be described as acts of solidarity where other people's movements take some of the symbolism and um, slogans of ours and apply them to their conditions. And you'll have people saying that that's somehow appropriating our experience. Now, as a child of the 60s and 70s, I was very used to people around the world identifying with the Black Freedom Movement. In the United States and around the world, uh, Black Panther parties that were sh showing up in all parts of the world. Um, you know, the uh, Young Lords Party among Puerto Ricans emulating the Black Panther Party. N no one said that was appropriate. It was um, flattery. It was solidarity. Now, unfortunately, there are some people that are suggesting that if one puts out a cry, Puerto Rican lives matter, or Palestinian lives matter, that that somehow is taking away from Black Lives Matter. And I'd say, no, not at all. And I think that what we're seeing around the world is that one, Black is the color of the racially oppressed, and that there is an identification with the victims of racist oppression. And I think that that's something that we have to really hammer away at. Yeah, it's, uh, it's really been very moving to me. I mean, you and I are both here in the, what we call the DMV. Mm -hmm. People outside don't understand that that's not the Department of Motor Vehicles, that's the District Maryland, right. um, Virginia kind of conurbation here around, in and around Washington, DC. And, you know, I've been down to, to um, a couple of the appropriately socially distanced um, actions here. And it's been very moving to see all kinds of people, but it does seem to be a black led movement, which mm -hmm. I think is great because, you know, there, there seems to be a, a very mature at many different levels black organization, um, not, as you said, not just one organization, but a right. network of, of organizations. So you were quite right to say that this is a kind of a confluence of the COVID crisis, which is wreaking such havoc in communities of color in this country yes. and in all marginalized communities around the world. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's really a marker of um, being economically and socially marginalized that you become much more um, susceptible to, to COVID, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. And then the economic complete collapse of the US economy, essentially, that's over right. the past three months, and the police oppression. So, you know, none of these things on their own is, is new, but they have all come together in this kind of perfect storm that seems from my point of view to be dragging the United States off its pedestal, <laughs> the pedestal it, it appropriated as global hegemon. Mm -hmm. And maybe we haven't yet, you know, pulled the statue completely off the pedestal and, and rolled him over to the river and, and dunked him in the river. But this global hegemony seems to be really like in question right now. So that makes kind of the need for adjustment, especially for, you know, white Americans or anybody who has believed in this kind of global hegemonic role, you know, the indispensable nation. 
There must be parallels with the ending of the settler colonial projects in Southern Africa that you are so familiar with or others, you know, colonial projects around the world that you were working on and in Africa and elsewhere back in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, what kind of lessons can we get take today from the anti-apartheid movement or the other anti-colonial movements of that era that will help us as Americans to build non-hegemonic relations with people in other countries? This is, this is like the, the souls of white folk. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, before I answer that, I actually do want to make reference to in a peculiar way, the Souls of White Folk um, essay. And let me explain why. There has been um, a lot of discussion about parallels between this moment and other moments. Many people talk about 1968, 1969. And I would say, no, 1919. That in the aftermath of World War I, there was the misnamed Spanish flu, because it was actually an American flu. There was a depression. There was Red Summer, which were the pogroms against African-American communities. There was the Red Scare, the attack on radicals. There was a Seattle general strike. And all of these things came together, creating an, a very explosive situation, both domestically, but also internationally when you add on the Versailles Treaty and what was going on in the aftermath of World War I, which brings me to the souls of white folk and why I think it's really such an important essay because Du Bois um, in the middle of World War I took a position that was different from other socialists in support of US involvement in the war. And he caught a lot of help for that. And it was good that he caught help because he was wrong. Um, but World War I and the Russian Revolution and the Versailles Treaty radicalized Du Bois. And the souls of white folk, you can, you can feel it when you're reading it. You can feel both the poetry of it and the anger that's contained in it. And I think it's analogous to right now that this confluence of forces is potentially bringing forth a whole new echelon of radicalized people who are gonna be looking to do something. And if they can't find anything, they will fall into cynicism. And that's one of my big, big fears, uh, which then takes me to your question. The, whether the, the relationship of the US to the rest of the world is changing and has been changing for quite some time. Um, in large part because of the restructuring of global capitalism, and most recently because of the idiocy uh, and incompetence of uh, Donald Trump. But what happens in the, if you want to take um, the South African situation, that I think is important for us to, to keep in mind is that in a moment of crisis, there are um, multiple scenarios that can unfold. And there is frequently the mistake that is made by those of us on the left, who in looking at these moments of excitement and moments of mobilization, that we project the optimal outcome as opposed to recognizing that there's a series or several different possibilities. In the case of South Africa, the fact that the African National Congress and the Pan-Africanist Congress of Itzania were or the two major groups were led by revolutionaries, um, in many cases, communists and other revolutionary forces led many people to assume that the South African transition would be a revolutionary transition and that it wouldn't be just the end of apartheid, but it would be the end of 
the particular kind of capitalist experiment that was playing out in South Africa. And it turned out that wasn't the case, that there was in fact a dramatic mass mobilization. There was incredible international support. There were high levels of organization among the people's movements, but the, neither the ANC nor the PAC could militarily defeat the South African Defense Force, nor could the South African Defense Force militarily defeat the ANC and the PNC and the others. And so it was a standoff of sorts. And so there was a transition away from apartheid, but it did not bring with it fully revolutionary conclusions. And there were many of the leaders that took power, the soon power after liberation, mm made a mistake, in my humble opinion, of um, not pressing forward with the kinds of structural reforms that were so necessary to keep progress moving in South Africa. We made that same mistake in the United States in the, as a result of the 1960s and early 70s in plateauing. We came to a plateau and could not get off that plateau. The current movement faces that as a possibility. And this is one of the reasons that organization and strategy become essential. And those are some of the lessons that I, I've learned. By the way, it says recording pause. Oh, I, I think the recording is going on. <laughs> Um, but thanks for, thanks for, um, looking at that. Um, so yeah, lessons from South Africa. Um, I want to, you're quite right that in that case, neither side was able militarily to impose its will on the other. So you had to have a negotiation, um, right. which did not give, you know, many supporters of the ANC everything that they wanted, certainly in terms of like, economic redistribution and restructuring. Um, but it was, it was still a very um, inspiring movement for Absolutely. me. Absolutely. It was incredibly inspiring for the entire world. And having visited South Africa several times after liberation, you could get that sense. But you also got the sense, and this is beginning in 99, um, of growing frustration and the fact that the leadership of the country had accepted uh, neoliberal globalization or what I call uh, capitalist fundamentalism as the guiding, uh, the guide, even though the leadership knew left language and left rhetoric and could spin all of this uh, as if they were Marxists, but were nevertheless accepting the precepts of neoliberalism. We have to be very careful about that here. Because Helena, I mean, one of the things that's been striking the last several weeks are the corporate forces that are waving the flag of Black Lives Matter. You know, and, and it's like when you have Nike praising Colin Kaepernick and, and you have the Major League Baseball owners saying Black Lives Matter, it's like, it's dizzying. You know, I mean, yeah. on the one hand, you want to say, well, this is good, it's a, the movement is pushing these people. But on the other hand, you have to be concerned that the, that the uh, result is uh, sort of a deflection of the direction. And, and certainly if you look at what's happening in terms of economic policy coming from the federal government right now, you know, they have been shoveling money into the financial institutions and, and the big corporations. Whereas what is, seems to me to be really needed is, is a, a very extensive kind of new deal. Right. Where the government itself would hire hundreds of thousands of people to go out and do basic um, infrastructure jobs, road building, um, fixing bridges, 
building and, and staffing hospitals, teaching children, all of those mm -hmm. things that our country so desperately needs. By the way, I learned something interesting the other day. I learned that the Civilian Conservation Corps, which is another thing that we need, we need a kind mm -hmm. of a green, a, a dedicated green aspect That's to right. this um, New Deal type employment. The Civilian Conservation Corps was actually headed by General Marshall, a, a, a military man mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who brought kind of, I guess, you know, military levels of organization and foresight and strategic thinking to the job and later went on to, you know, uh, undertake the, the Marshall Plan in Europe. Mm -hmm. But I mean, this is great. We could mm -hmm. actually repurpose a whole chunk of the US military that is currently de deployed at 800 bases around the world and have them work with unemployed people in this country to do civilian, you know, conservation corps type things. There are all kinds of exciting ideas out there. And you're right, we need to strategize from now mm -hmm because the corporations that you mentioned are not about to solve the problems of um, low income people. Um, so if, if we look at the international dimensions of this, mm -hmm. when you, you know, when we were talking about the demise of apartheid, that was in a sense kind of the full flowering of neoliberalism and the capitalist economy around the world. But do you think that the, that capitalism and neoliberalism and what, whatever they call the Washington consensus, I mean, mm. haven't they taken a huge beating with this mm -hmm. current crisis? Yes, no question. Um, so uh, capitalism, as you know, goes through uh, different stages of accumulation. And neoliberalism itself was not the result of a plan that was created by some geniuses, even though there were some geniuses that had a plan. Um, it was largely an experiment or a series of experiments in response to the crisis that Keynesian economics found itself in by the end of the 1960s. Um, and it's been a very uh, successful for the, multi, for, the, for the rich, for the elite, very successful experiment but it has been taking serious hits since the 2008 collapse, but it has not disappeared. Um, and I believe that, the, that there's a few things there. One is that there is a debate within capital uh, regarding what, what can and should succeed neoliberalism. And there is also a weakness on the part of the people's movements about what the people's movements can advance. And that's in part related to both the crises of, um, crisis of socialism and the crises of the, what Samir Amin called the national populist projects. Uh, both of those have led to a situation where many of the people's organizations are really unclear what is the next step. Um, and there have been experiments, the so-called pink tide in Latin America, which had certain important successes, um, but has been pushed back. Uh, we had the, um, the so-called Arab Spring, the Arab democratic uprisings, which one can argue have actually not really ended, but they went through a certain stage that um, did not complete, did not complete a revolutionary process. Um, so you have this problem, and in this problem, in this moment and problem, some of the dangers include uh, forms of right-wing populism and Bonapartism uh, that uh, are, are, are showing themselves throughout the world, not just in the advanced capitalist world. Um, the polarization of wealth, the environmental crisis, limiting resources, changing shifts in population have provided fertile ground for right-wing populist movements. And some of these populist movements embrace elements of neoliberalism, 
as well as elements of a kind of welfareism, but a racist welfareism, as you see like in Poland. Um, and where this is gonna, how this is gonna play out remains very uncertain. And when I talk about Bonapartism, what I mean is that there may be circumstances where neoliberal capital is no longer able to rule through political figures that really embrace it, but where people's movements are not capable of removing neoliberal capital. And in that situation, there could be all kinds of situations ranging from fascism to military dictatorships to semi-authoritarian regimes. Right, um, I guess they say that every crisis presents both great opportunities and great risks and Correct. it's up to us to try to minimize the opportunities and no, maximize the opp opportunities and, and guard against the risks. One last mm -hmm. question, mm -hmm. China, um, mm. do you think um, that we're gonna see a, a rising cold war against China as being a kind of an organizing principle for broad sections of the ruling elite in this country, including in the Democratic Party? Well, the, the, the ruling classes of the United States, uh, uh, truth be told, are very confused about how to relate to China because China is integral to global capitalism. It, we're not dealing with the China of Mao Zedong. We're dealing with a China that has integrated itself into global capitalism uh, with Chinese characteristics, so to speak. And, um, and so these transnational corporations uh, rely on China. Um, the United States, truth be told, relies on Chinese investments. Um, and so you have that as a problem. Um, then you have uh, a sort of, I'm going to call it a mass sentiment. I don't mean everybody has it, but a mass-based sentiment that is trying to make sense of the restructuring of global capitalism, the relocation of industry, uh, in many cases outside of the United States, but more frequently, within the United States, but to rural areas. Um, it's trying to make sense of the, what you were saying before about hegemony, but in racial terms. Um, you know, in other words, it's not just that the US economy may not be hegemonic, but that white people have found themselves now in this very different position. I'm talking about, um, the sort of working classes and uh, um, professional managerial class and, and, uh, and small business owners have found themselves in a situation that they weren't expecting of a declining living standard. And it's in that moment that right-wing populist scapegoating becomes very, very um, persuasive to basically blame things on China to blame things on Mexico, et cetera. So you have this political factor that's going on. Um, and then you have the question of that China is not a puppet state. Even though it's tied into global capitalism, it's not a puppet state of anyone else. It has a very strong military very sophisticated high tech and is building sea power. And this means several things. One, for many of China's neighbors, including Vietnam and the Philippines, people are worried. They're worried about Chinese hegemonism. And then for the United States, there's a the question of, will they now have to compete with another global military power? Um, and so this makes for a very dangerous situation, as you were saying before, of, um, cold, of a cold war, a new cold war. 
the the Chinese are not. You, you want to make many criticisms of the Chinese government, and I make plenty of them. Um, but I don't see evidence that the Chinese are interested in provoking a Cold War with the United States. What they've said pretty much is something that we used to say on the streets of the Bronx, which is, if you start the fight, I'm going to finish it. And I don't think that enough people appreciate the significance of that. Yeah, good point. Interesting. Well, listen, we're going to open it up now um, to um, a few questions that we've gotten coming in and that we, we only have about uh, 10, 15 minutes for questions. Okay. I'm going to hand things over to my colleague, Charlotte Cates, who's going to host the whole Q&A period. If people have additional questions, please send them in via chat or via the Q&A. Um, which you'll find at the bottom of the screen. So Charlotte, over to you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Helena, and thank you, Bill, for an insightful and informative discussion that has provoked some excellent questions um, to, to dig deeper into some of the issues that have been brought up already in this conversation. Um, we have a few questions from Beth Lyons, who is actually the alternate representative of the United Nations of the International Association of Democratic Lawyers and a longtime international criminal defense attorney raising some uh, several interesting points. And one question that Beth is asking is, uh, you know, what are some of the ideological issues that need to be addressed now to keep up the momentum? You mentioned in the beginning um, the different ways that international solidarity is viewed um, within a lot of these discussions. In addition, there's been um, in the mainstream media language in the past few weeks, the term white privilege has entered the discussion. What things need to be done in order to transform this form of this notion into a force for equality and justice, particularly in the United States, which is a society based on white supremacist bourgeois rule? So Charlotte, more importantly, Beth Lyons is a friend of mine. Um, <laughs> For, for decades, and I, I miss her. And so um, it's good, good that Beth connected. Um, so in terms of ideological issues, let me try to answer this briefly. Um, so one thing was what I mentioned before, which is what I'd call sort of black exclusivity um, or black uniqueness. And this is where um, I think it's a reflection of the infection of postmodernism in our movement. Uh, and it's the idea that our situation is so unique that any comparisons and analogies are appropriation and are, in a, and, and are therefore incorrect. And this view keeps us on a defensive permanently because it denies us the ability to build strategic alliances with other forces that are facing racist oppression. This is one challenge. The se a second challenge uh, related to what uh, Beth was raising about white privilege is that the term white privilege, I think, has been corrupted. Um, the, the term white privilege as articulated by people like Theodore Allen, um, and in fact, you could even go back to Lenin and his references to national privilege, was about, was not a personality disorder. It was about a system, a system of oppression. And the system of oppression that brings with it privilege, privilege is equivalent to identifying a differential in treatment between populations that's imposed upon them by the ruling elites. So for example, when you have white people that come into a meeting and they'll, they'll say something like, well, let me just acknowledge my privilege. That's like absurd. I, first of all, I'm not really interested in hearing that, right? It doesn't mean anything. What means something is whether you're gonna be a John Brown or an Ann Braden, right? You're gonna actually engage in the anti-racist struggle, recognizing that you have an interest in the outcome. So ideologically, we have to sort of, to, to borrow from Cabral, return to the source. And in this case, 
we have to return to what the essence means, uh, the essence of white privilege, that we're fighting a system of white privilege, a system of white, uh, white supremacist national oppression. It's not about making white people better people, or the white people will become better people when we defeat white supremacist national oppression. Thank you so much. Um, we have a, f a couple of additional questions that have also come in as well. Um, we have a question from Martha Schmidt, which is looking at the issue of police unions in the United States. Um, you've written about this topic, and it's also a large topic that has come up for discussion in the movement, particularly among people involved in labor activism as well. What do you think about police unions in the United States? Um, should they be permitted? The International Labor Organization allows states to accept police from the right to organize. And just to say that Martha Schmidt is another exceptional uh, long-term human rights lawyer who has uh, joined the conversation today. Thank you. Um, well, I believe that any worker or employee should have the right to unionize, um, including soldiers. Um, and in some parts of the world, soldiers are unionized. Um, I, uh, I think that telling, particularly in the public sector, some workers that they cannot unionize puts us on a very slippery slope, which is what the right wing would like to do, uh, whereby they can start with police and then move to teachers. And I would put a dollar to a donut that that is exactly the order that would follow, police and then teachers, and then it would go on from there. Um, so that's point number one. Second, police or law enforcement unions are among the most conservative uh, elements of organized labor, hands down. This is, not about a, this is not a discussion about individual law enforcement officers. I know some police, that are great people. I know some people in corrections that are great people. This is not about who you know, it's about the system and recognizing that the system of law enforcement is part of the repressive apparatus of the capitalist state. It has a particular role and that role creates a certain kind of culture, a quasi-military authoritarian culture that affects the people that are in it. That's the reality of it. And so when you have law enforcement in with the rest of the union movement, as I've been saying the last several weeks, it plays the role of an anchor on a ship that's trying to leave harbor, but the anchor has been deployed. Um, and it, it holds the ship back from gaining speed. And you can see that in any number of unions where they have significant law enforcement components, many of whom are very active. So um, my personal feeling is that law enforcement uh, unions should all be together. There should be like one national law enforcement union and they should be together and they should not be part of organized labor because they, they're not operating, as I was saying in this article in, in these times, they don't operate based on the ethos that A. Philip Randolph articulated, one of the great leaders of the labor movement. He said, the essence of trade unionism is social uplift. Labor has been, the labor movement has been the haven for the dispossessed, the poor, the disenfranchised. That is not the ethos of law enforcement unions. The ethos for the law enforcement unions is to protect their members. And so if we're talking about building a 21st century labor movement, it really needs to be guided by what, uh, what Randolph was suggesting. Now, one other piece to this is that while the law enforcement unions are the most conservative, they're not the only conservative force. And that the uh, US trade union movement has a long and checkered history when it comes to race and gender uh, in terms of who was included, who was excluded. Uh, you know, the industrial workers of the world were the only federation that refused to accept segregated um, uh, affiliates. And, you know, you've had 
back and forth over the years. So my feeling is that there's a broad discussion that needs to take place in the movement about the role of law enforcement in a democratic society, the role that law enforcement unions should play as well as other unions, but also this broader question about how do we deepen the struggle for racial justice? Thank you so much. And we do, uh, we have one more question I think that we'll get to. Um, and I'm going to combine a couple of questions here. Ardeth Platt asks, as a mentor and mobilizer, what will you do or suggest be put before the movement to capitalize on the opportunities before us? It seems like a key time to live the demands. And going back to Beth, um, she mentioned that you discussed the spontaneity of the movement in the beginning, as opposed to the leadership of one or two organizations. In this context, what do you think the role of organization is in maintaining and moving the current movement forward? And let me just add one more. Um, someone asked about Bonapartism. Bonapartism is a reference to a political situation in which no particular class is strong enough to dominate the state and that um, a group or a clique rises to manage the state. It, the state remains capitalist, but there's a, a stalemate in the class struggle. Um, and that's what it, it refers to. It, it was from Marx and his discussion of Louis Napoleon, Napoleon III in France. Um, to your question, what should we do? I'm glad you asked. Uh, one of the things that I've been pushing is that I believe that organized labor and its allies and community groups, longstanding community groups, um, need to join forces in this moment and build on the momentum and energy to develop a people's anti-repression coalition. And that this needs to be a national effort. It needs to be an effort that uh, insists uh, that there should be no troops deployed in the United States um, to address the social crisis, that uh, the police need to be uh, that law enforcement needs to be restructured and demilitarized. There needs to be justice for the lynched, and there needs to be anti-austerity. So in other words, because we're talking about a spontaneous movement, we're not talking about a movement led by XYZ political party or, or ABC political movement. We're talking about a disparate movement that has all these different forces, and there are these demands that are coming forward We've got to listen to that and formulate it in a way that moves forward a process. So we're actually moving forward a battle to introduce structural reforms in the system that push things to the left. Um, in the absence of some sort of people's anti-repression coalition or pro-democracy effort, whatever you want to call it, one of the dangers it, which you can see historically, is that the right will be sitting back sharpening their knives. They will be waiting for our movement to crest and to decline. If you think of Italy in 1919 and the factory takeovers that were uh, spreading and the strikes, and many people believe that Italy was on the verge of a socialist revolution, 1919, and within three years, fascism, right? The, the, uh, the movement, the, the, the great workers movement um, that had emerged declined. There was insufficient organization. It was disunity on the left. And in that situation, the combination of the landed interest and elements of capital joined forces, back Mussolini, and well, you know the rest. Um, and that's what we have to be concerned about. Thank you so much for those words. And now I'm just going to uh, hand it back over to Just World Educational President, Helena Kovan, for some uh, concluding thoughts. Yeah, thank you so much, Charlotte. Um, you do a great job helping us with the, uh, with the webinars. And Bill, thank you. I love your view from outer space, but clearly your feet are firmly <laughs> on the ground. Um, thank and you. 
just been a real pleasure to have you. Um, I'll say goodbye to you in a moment. Um, but just before I do, I want to remind people that there is a video being made of this uh, webinar. And we've made videos of the earlier ones with uh, Richard Falk and, and Medea Benjamin. Now what we're doing is we're building those videos and associated materials into an online resource center. Um, that we will continue to build up, that we hope will become a great resource as our Syria Resource Center already has become. But of course, this always costs money. Um, so if you want to support our project, um, go to our website, www.justworldeducational.org, and um, you'll find the donate button there and all uh, donations very gratefully accepted. Um, another thing I'll ask you to do um, is as you leave the webinar, this time you will get sent to our evaluation form. I'm sorry it didn't work last time, but we really do want people's input um, to help us design to make this project be as useful as possible to as many people as possible. So, you know, if you can fill out your evaluations, that would be great. Um, lastly, we have um, Next Wednesday at 1 p.m., um, Vijay Prashad is going to be with us. Um, and I, okay, view uh, slideshow. Yes, oh no, I'm so sorry, oh my Lord. Okay, uh, we go right through my slideshow and end up with Vijay Prashad. <laughs> um, one of these days I'll, I'll learn how to do this. So Vijay Prashad, I'm, I'm sure you, uh, many of you know about him. Um, he is an amazingly um, inspiring leader of global thought. He's the chief editor of Left Word Books, the director of Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, and he's the chief correspondent for Globetrotter. He's published numerous books and many, many wonderful reports. His newest book, Washington Bullets, is going to be um, released on July 8th. So I'm delighted that we're gonna be able to have a sort of little preview from VJ of the book. The book, by the way, has a preface by President Evo Morales Aimer. Um, so I'm sure it's gonna be a, a wonderful book and we very much look forward to having all of the attendees and um, talking with VJ Prashad next Wednesday at 1 p.m. Um, and now comes the sad time when I have to say goodbye and thank you to Bill Fletcher. Bill, it's been a real pleasure to be working with you again. Um, we've done a couple of projects recently and thank you so much. It's my pleasure, Alan. Thank you so, so much. I enjoyed this as well. Yeah, I mean, you're raising such important issues and um, thanks to you, thanks to Charlotte Cates and thanks to all of our attendees here, um, people who asked questions, people who didn't ask questions, and please fill out your evaluation forms and we look forward to having you with us next week. Thanks and goodbye. <laughs>